you the best thing that ever happened to you? Savior, I fell fire from above, and I've been down to the river. I ain't the same, a prodigal return. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. And I've been washed by the blood. I'm no stranger to the prison And I've worn shackles and chains But I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back I'll never be the same that's why I sing, all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. And I've been washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man. Breaks him down to his knees. God, I've been broken more than a time or two. Yes, Lord. Then you picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. Come on and sing. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven, and I've been washed by the blood. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven, and I, I've been washed by the blood. Amen. Have you been washed by the blood this morning? Amen. Stand together and fellowship with the choir as they come down. Amen.
you see just how we'll have Jerrica and uh, Brooke to come up and sing for us this morning. Amen. still shines the reason for those silver lines you can see the skies are blue it's all clear from heaven's view above the storm peaceful calm he weighs the winds within his palm still shines the reason for those silver lines you can see the skies are blue it's all clear from heaven's view above the storm peaceful calm he weighs the winds within his palm you can trust in him when clouds begin to form cause the sun still shines The sun still shines above the storm. I've been there and so have you. The sky turns gray out of the blue. While the gathering clouds replace the perfect day. It's never felt this dark before As the rain begins to pour Though it's just begun It didn't come to stay Above 
the storm, the sun still shines. The reason for the silver lines. You can see the skies are blue. It's all clear from heaven's view. Above the storm, peaceful calm. He weighs the winds within his palm. You can trust in still shines the reason for the silver lines you can see the skies are blue it's all clear from heaven's view above the storm peaceful calm he weighs the winds within his palm Cause the sun still shines above the storm. Amen. How many of you are glad today that the sun is still shining? Amen. His name is Jesus, and I want to tell you, uh, the Bible says in the book of Malachi that he arises with healing in his wings. And I'm glad today to know that we serve a God uh, who is alive, he is well, and uh, thank him for the healing that God gives us. And I'm glad that in, even in the storm, God is still in control. Amen. And uh, we just want to give the Lord praise this morning for his wonderful blessings. Is it wonderful today to know Jesus? Amen. 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 I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of Philippians. Uh, the book of Philippians, if you'll turn there, and uh, we're going to look at chapter number 2 uh, in the book of Philippians. Uh, if you'll take your Bibles as you uh, go through the New Testament, if you're looking for Philippians, it is found uh, where Gal uh, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, then you have Colossians. Somebody taught me a long time ago how to, how to figure that out, uh, and it was General Electric Power company. All right, uh, so if you'll look for the E, and then you'll find the P, power. Uh, there is power in the Word, by the way, amen? Uh, but I want to praise Him uh, that God is in control, that God is alive and well. How many of you believe He is at this morning that God is on the throne, amen? And I want to praise the Lord for all that God has done in our hearts and lives as we are uh, entering into a, a brand new series this morning on something that God has uh, placed in my heart about six, uh, eight months months ago uh, and uh, continued to work uh, in my life through that uh, and uh, the Lord just worked in our hearts as a, as a church to come together. Uh, you should have received one of these books uh, by now if you haven't. Uh, we do have some more copies if you'll see them at the Resource Center. Uh, but there's uh, something that uh, we, we're as we go through this book, uh, not talking about the things that we could do or we might do or we can do or I should do, but that I will do. And when we think about that and you put it in the context of today's society, there's something that happens in our, in our brains when we say that we're going to do something else. How many of you need something else to do in your life? Would you raise your hand? All right, we got a few. And um, we think about how the word I will, it's kind of like uh, somebody asks you to do something in the business, busyness of life already, and you're saying, well, you know something, I just, I am not, I cannot do anything else. Has anybody ever felt like that you could not do anything else? Amen. Would you raise your hand? It happens. Amen. But what about in our spiritual life? What happens when life gets so busy and things get so happening around our life that we don't have the opportunity or, I'm going to put this out here, y'all ready? We don't have the heart to serve God. 
And so uh, many times uh, serving the Lord or coming to church or doing things in the church becomes like other things that we do all in, in life. It's things that we have to do and we push through those things uh, just waiting till the uh, clock goes off the next morning or waking up before the clock goes off because there's so much to do. And we just kind of throw church and doing what God would have us to do down in the middle of all of that and it's just become something else that we have to do to accomplish in life to put the check mark on and say well okay I did this now I can move to the next thing but what about our heart when I think about this I will if you have read uh, the the introduction uh, we're going to have a multiple choice test here in just a few minutes and if you have not read uh, the introduction by now your ties went up another 20 percent I'm going to do a test on it I want you to think about what is going on. You say, well, this is just something else to do. But what about in my life? When my heart, when your heart gets out of rhythm, what's going to happen? Things are going to change. Sometimes you're going to take an ambulance ride because you are feeling like you're going to have a heart attack. If your heart gets out of rhythm, things are not working properly as they should. And so the same thing can happen in our life as a Christian. I want to ask you this morning, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Listen, that is the priority in our life is knowing Jesus. But then what do we do with Jesus now that he's living in my heart? Somebody that is big enough to say, uh, let there be light and there's light. Let there be uh, the world and the creation and all the things that have happened. Let there be a cross. I'm going to die for the sins of the world. And I, on the third day, I'm going to raise again. He lives in our life. So if he is so powerful and so mighty, Am I supposed to be following him? And we're supposed to follow Jesus? So in following him, how is it sometimes we lose our heart, our heart gets out of rhythm, our life gets out of step, and it becomes sometimes the place that we don't want to say, I will any longer. It's amazing to me in my life and in I've watched others' lives whenever it seems like everything crashes in. The first things that we begin to go and we start unplugging in our life are the things that are going to help us the most if we will follow them. It's easy to say, well, you know something, I'm just so busy, I don't want to go to church anymore, I don't, want, I don't read my Bible anymore, I don't pray it like I should, and all these things that we begin to unplug in our life and plug other things in are the things that are not going to last, they're going to bring us completely down until finally we are away from God and out of God's will. And so when we think about the word I will, I could just say this morning, we all know that we should serve God, therefore I will. But I want to tell you, that's not going to work. We know we should. We know we could. We know we might. We also know that we, we can. But that word, I will, it is a submission of my life. And so uh, this morning as we look at, at some of these scriptures, I, I hope God will uh, take this time to speak uh, into our life. But I want you to look with me in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 5. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 1 down through verse number 11 is where most of our context is taken from, or a lot of it this morning. But I want you to look in verse number 5. He said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. I want to ask you something this morning. Where's my mind? I can be in church without being in church. My mind can be everywhere else. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We can, be, we can be physically sitting in church, but where's my mind? We can be physically saying, I will, or I'm a serving God, or I'm a Christian, or I'm a believer, but where is my mind? We're looking at the Word this morning, amen? And I want to ask you, where's your mind? 
Where is my mind? He said in verse uh, number five, he said who, or verse number six, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Uh, that's what Jesus said. I am God in the flesh. Uh, and so here's what happens in verse number seven. But made himself of no reputation. Jesus did not come into this world uh, born of a virgin and wait with a flag or a deity around him saying, wow, there was not a glow around him everywhere he went uh, saying, this is God. He did not come waving a flag. The Bible said he came with no reputation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of John that he came into his own, and his own received him not. But look what happens in verse number 7. He said, and took up on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross there's a few things that we see right quick as we as we look at our life of where we are and these things of our will we see something that Jesus did there was the mind of God he had the word in his life we find him as he submits himself as a servant to serve others and to serve serve of God and then we find him becoming obedient unto death those steps in life of following the will of God the Bible said in verse number nine look at it wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name how many of you believe his name is above every name amen how did that happen it came because he's God in the flesh it came because he humbled himself it came because he was obedient unto death it came because he's God in the flesh that rose from the dead but the Bible says in verse number 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I will. So if God is so powerful, why is the church so weak? If God is so powerful, why am I as a Christian, if Jesus lives in me, why am I struggling in my life? We're looking at these nine traits of a uh, being, I will, of an outward focused uh, Christian, of somebody who gives our life to focus on who God is, what God would have for me. So sometimes we get caught up in I want. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We come to church, we want, we want to be entertained. We come to life and we want everything lined up like we like it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, we like, if somebody's serving French vanilla ice cream instead of just regular vanilla ice cream, and we like French, we like regular vanilla better than French vanilla, sometimes we say, I just don't want that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, I want you to look at your neighbor real quick. Look at him. I want you to smile at them and say, you're spoiled to death. I want, we want our stuff. We want our Christian life to look like we want it to look. We want everything to line up with the gods of the suns and shine upon us all of the time as a Christian and everything to be perfect in our life. Amen? Amen. And most of the time, sometimes, uh, oftentimes, if it's not, then we are thrown off course and off base and our faith begins to be doubted and we begin to be in fear. So this morning, I want us to look as we have already looked at these scriptures, but changing my perspective on a church, on the world, on my Christian life. What does God say? How does God say I am supposed to be living a Christian life? We read about that. Number one thing I'm going to talk about this morning is unhappy. Has anybody ever been unhappy before? Would you raise both hands? Amen. Unhappy. We're going to talk about this morning right quick, the unhappy church member. Look at somebody and say, are you un an unhappy church member? Wow. Wow. Get the, come on with the invitation music. Let's pray. Amen. <laughs> unhappy. Have you ever been unhappy in your Christian life? That's a yes or no. 
Wow, have we ever had those times in our life where we think, wow, what is going on? When I think about unhappiness and think about Christ as a servant, how you got to remember what Jesus did before he goes to the cross. The Bible said he girded himself, he took a pan, and he got down and washed his disciples' feet. He said, I want you to know why I am here. I am not here to be served. I am here to serve you. Do you know, as a Christian, we will never be happy if we are not serving the Lord. Right. Never. You cannot make your Christian life have joy without serving God. And if here we look at this unhappy person, unhappiness in life, changing my perspective in my own life. He says it like this in the book of Proverbs 29 and verse number 18. Without a vision, the people do what? We perish. How about he said, happy is he that keepeth the law. So here's what God says to me and you. He said, I want you to know something. In order to have the vision of my perspective on what God would have for my life as a believer, he said, I have to have my vision. I like God's vision. Without a vision, people perish. That is including all of us in our vision. So as we think about an unhappy church member, we go back to the introduction. So this morning, I'm just going to be preaching uh, primarily the introduction of this book. It was 70 pages long. No, I'm just kidding. We think about the introduction. Can somebody tell me what the lady's name was that he used that, that, that is in the introduction? Heather, praise the Lord. You know what? When a man's football team goes out, he can read. Thought I'd say that. It's somewhere down in Texas and got a big star. All right. You got time now, don't you, brother? So we look at the perspective. What are we, what are we looking for? I only said that because he texted me last night a lot about my football team. So when you look and you see and you understand where she was, she became unhappy. She had been serving in the church. Uh, she, had, uh, she had got married, and her and her husband, uh, they ended up going to the church that he was, uh, he was from, and uh, they were involved, and she was doing all kind of things and was happy, and they were uh, looking at what uh, all that God could do to their lives and how God could use them, and uh, all that God was going to do, they had, uh, they had a vision. They, had, uh, they were all out and all in to whatever God had for them to see God do a work through their lives, whatever that meant and however it meant in the church but then she became came to the place where she became un unhappy how did that happen when you read the story, how you understand it, and we see it, how we see it happen through how the Bible, how where people do the same thing. Peter, how Peter is a great example of it. How about you watch her life, and then all of a sudden something happens in her life, her and her husband, how they, how they end up having struggles, they get a divorce. And then she says, I was relieved whenever I left the church. Wow, there's something about being in that place of life where you're unhappy at the greatest place in the world. I want to tell you, church, I know it's been downplayed. I've had people to tell me that are supposedly working hard in ministries to say, I, just want, I, I say something about church, I say, well, it ain't about church. I just want to let you know something. It is about church. If you do not, a church is our place where God brings us together, where we are involved, and then you, have, you do have a relationship with Jesus. I know it's about a relationship with Jesus, but Jesus loved the church so much that every time you read in the Gospels, you find him over and 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 over being in the temple. Why did he do that? Because they gathered together, and that is what God's people do. We gather so that we can go forward, and so we understand saying this is the greatest place on earth but sometimes we become unhappy how does that happen there's uh, i do not even know what time it is i know we're, we're i promise you by the help of the lord we're going to go through this very quickly because we need to see it for one purpose that god would speak to our heart you ever been unhappy 
at church. Everybody unhappy in your life, in your Christian life, or in life in general. There's four things we're going to look at, and we're going to look at them. I, I should have all the scriptures here, but they are also, uh, if you uh, think about it, they're also uh, on the app. You can pull all these up. We're going to talk about, first of all, one reason we become unhappy is sometimes we feel isolated. You ever felt like you're unnoticed? Not only in life, but in church. You can go in and come out, and it's like nobody even notices that we're here. Anybody. You feel isolated. It's like, wow, I'm just in, I'm out. You say, well, preacher, we're just talking about feelings. No, uh, whenever we become unhappy or becoming unhappy, we begin to feel isolated that we are not connected. I want to tell you, there is one of the greatest men in the Word of God who felt the same thing. His name is Elijah. Elijah had called down fire from heaven. You say, well, you know something in my Christian life, there's a time that fire burned and every time the choir was singing, I just had to get up and say, boy, I'm glad I'm saved. But then, begin to walk in walk and walking in life and watching things around us and how we, we, the, the focus changes and oh Elijah he had just called down fire from heaven and then the next thing you know and it's found in 1 Kings chapter number 19 and verse number 14 Elijah goes out and he said Lord there's nobody else left there's nobody serving you nobody cares who I am nobody cares about me anymore and the Bible says he goes out into the wilderness and he said Lord thank you you for a wonderful life. Thank you for blessing me the way you have. I'm done. I'm going to die. You know why? He was isolated. You know, I found out a lot of times in isolation, I usually isolate myself. I remember years ago, I remember this story very, very well. It was a, a man that we had helped and encouraged and tried to be part of his life and tried to uh, help him. And uh, he, he had said that he had trusted the Lord. And uh, somebody said, well, uh, preacher, somebody came to him and said, preacher, I just want to tell you, they're not getting any support. Nobody's helping them. I said, uh, we call, we try, uh, all these things. I said, I want to tell you something. I said, this person don't want help. Well, preacher, that's all they're talking about. They do this Bible study. They're talking about this, and nobody says, I said, I want to tell you something. When somebody comes in late, and they get up early and run to the parking lot to leave, they don't want anybody in their business. Right. Yet you cannot be isolated and, and blame it on everybody else. Amen. Elijah steps out of his hole for everybody that could help him, and he goes over and said, well, Lord, they just think nobody else that cares for me. We feel like that. It happens in our life. If that's happening in your life, you are not alone. Here's the greatest prophet in the world sitting out and saying, God, I feel like nobody even cares for me. You know what God did for Elijah? God didn't say, Elijah, I'm going to tell you something. You need to get back down yonder, or I'm going to whoop you, and I'm going to destroy everything you have. God said, Elijah, I want to give you some meat. Elijah, I want to help you where you are. I want to feed you. He sent some angels down with some meat. The Bible said he went in that meat, for, in the strength of that meat, for 40 days. Now, I want to tell you, that's some powerful protein. Amen? 40 days. And he went, and then he goes in a cave looking for some answers. Can I just let you know, and me know, as a reminder, when we are unhappy in our, in our church life, unhappy in our Christian life, we, are, we can search and search and search. You can search in the light. You can search in the forest. I have people tell me, preacher, I go to church all the time. I just go out and worship creation. I want to tell you that is not biblical. It is not the word of God. We go out and we, we come together to worship God in church, and then we can go out. Amen? Amen. When we think about what God has done with Elijah, God said, Elijah, I just want to let you know something, Elijah. He said, there's an earthquake. Surely, God, you're in that earthquake. I'm isolated. I'm out in this cave. All these things. And the Bible said, and it was in the still, small voice of God where Elijah's life changed. Here's what God said to Elijah. Elijah, I just want you to know. I just want to encourage you, Elijah. He's patting him on the back. He said, you've done great things. I've been working in your life. But I just want to let you know, 
back at Israel, back in Jerusalem, if you'll just get back there, I have 7,000 people still serving me. Listen, don't let Satan lie to you that you are by yourself. That isolation uh, that happens, and when isolation happens, we feel like we don't fit in uh, any longer, and what we do uh, does not matter, and how we serve uh, does not matter. I want to ask you something. Who are we serving? Wow, when we look at this isolation, it's easy to get isolated. Amen? It's easy to withdraw. It's easy to pull ourselves back. And that's exactly what happened in Heather's life in this book. She separated herself and said, wow, you know something? I don't want that anymore in my life. She became unhappy. But what about inspection? You know what happens when we become unhappy? We start inspecting. Man, we start looking for every single thing coming and going that can be our excuse of why we are unhappy. Wow, we begin to look and we begin to see. Here's what happens. We start looking and we think, nothing is right. Nothing is right. Nothing works the way that it used to. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, we get to, oh, my goodness. Right there is some glitter that is left over from the Christmas play. Right there. I can see it. It looks like a snowflake. I cannot believe somebody would do that. They are not taking care of things. Man, we look at somebody's life and say, "Mm, yeah, you know something? I tell you what, I was here, but they wasn't. Boy, I tell you. Yep, it just don't look right. And we begin to we begin to go in and micro every single little thing that is not going to have anything to do with our eternal value. We begin to inspect in our life. We begin to see other people's lives and say, "Wow, oh yeah, that just don't that's just not right." When we're listening to do this, and say, "God, what do you want me to do?" It's so easy in life to inspect everything else and miss why I am unhappy. Why is my heart like it is toward God and the things of God? Here's what she said. Why do, why do I, she began to think, as you read the, uh, the introduction, she began to think, why am I unhappy? Why do I not enjoy attending a worship any longer? I want to ask you, in our inspection, has God changed? Has the Word of God changed? In our lives, it is looking and saying, God, okay, what do you want from me? Where am I? Oh, when we start looking at others, we fail to see us. We fail to see where we are. The children of Israel... Listen, they were, they were the most excited people in the world. They had been praying and saying, Lord, I want you to come and take us out. God, deliver us. Moses, their deliverer, was not even with them. God, God goes over, he picks Moses on the shoulder and said, Moses, I want to tell you something. I am getting ready to use you. You're going to deliver the children of Israel. Moses said, Lord, I like these sheep. I'm not really interested in going back. I'm not really interested in going before the Pharaoh. But as, as you watch them, they, uh, they continue uh, to cry out, God, deliver us. And the Bible says uh, that the Lord comes and he delivers uh, Israel from Egypt. They were slaves in bondage. You do realize uh, they were losing their lives. They, were, they lost their livelihood. They were losing everything that they had. They had been prosperous, and now a new Pharaoh has come. Everything is going away, so they have become uh, very uh, distraught in their lives, and their desire has been, God, deliver us, and the Lord delivers them. God blesses them. The Bible says in the book of uh, Exodus chapter number 13, said they get to the place uh, they've been delivered, that the Red Sea, God does a miracle. He splits the Red Sea. Uh, they, the dust has not even settled from where they crossed over on the Red Sea. They have sung, they've worshiped. They said, wow, look what God is going to do. And the very next thing that happens is, they said, Moses, can't believe you brought us out here to kill us. We're going to die right here. 
The God who split the Red Sea, the God who just delivered us from Egypt, hey, we, we just, Lord, we're just unhappy. We're going back to Egypt. Can I just let you know something? If you're saved, if you're saved someone, would you say amen? Did you know you don't have nothing to go back to? <laughs> God's already erased it, amen? If you go back, you're just stepping off a cliff. There's nothing there, hallelujah. Can I let you know as God's people, oh, listen, we need to understand what begins to happen in our heart. They begin to murmur against Moses. They begin to murmur against God. They can't believe we are brought here to die rather than to go forward and see what God is going to do. Matthew chapter 7 says it like this. He said there's so many times we are looking at every body else's life saying oh yeah I can see this little teeny thing in your eye and at the same time the Bible said we had like a beam in our own eye it's easy to get to be an inspector when we're unhappy you can be an inspirer when you're walking with God but when you become an inspector you know what inspectors do Working in furniture, I know what inspectors do. They are not looking for everything to be right. They're looking for what's wrong. I mean, I know what I'm talking about. They do have a wrong stitch. Is it wrong? Y'all know what I mean? How many, we have any furniture inspectors in here? Anybody that's ever done it before, would you raise your hand? There we go. Y'all know. I used to have a guy who worked on the bed line, and we took a chain. We would beat holes in the wood. Ain't that a blessing? Amen. And so what you'd have to do whenever you began to put that headboard together, you had to make sure everything was smooth. There was nothing that was wrong. Everything was good. You put it together. You glue it. You stay put. You run the screws in. You do all those things. By the time it gets to the end of the line, that inspector is going to inspect it. We had an inspector. If you work on a line, you don't like the inspector. Sorry. Worked on this line. Man, we had them beds. They would be beautiful. He get in here and say, "Uh, this one's got a place in it right here." I'd go back, work on it, bring it back. Then he'd beat it with a chain. <laughs> why didn't you beat that thing with a chain from the first time? Amen. You know why? Cause they looking. They want to make sure their job is done like it should be. They're looking for the mistakes. Can I just tell you what happens in our Christian life? When you first get saved, you don't see mistakes. Man, it's like, glory to God, he saved me. I mean, church, what can I do, preacher? Preacher, can I just pick up chewing gum off the bottom of the pews? Preacher, can, we do, can I clean the parking lot? Preacher, you got anything I can do? Oh, yeah, bathroom's running up? Yeah, give me a plunger. I don't need no gloves. <laughs> Amen? When we come unhappy, it's like, why has nobody cleaned that up yet? Right. <laughs> Amen? It happens, I'm not just, it happens in our spiritual life, it happens in our life in general, uh, that inspection. Well, how when we look and see, we got, I, got, I got four minutes, y'all ready? Inspection. There's that indignation that happens. You see this little dude right here, don't he look happy? That is a Sunday morning worshiper right there, amen. But they all come to the 11 o'clock service, just gonna let y'all know. You know what has just happened? When you read this introduction, Heather has been out of church for over four years. She has her children. They are failing in school. They are struggling in every single area of their life. And instead of going to church, which she knows as a Christian, God is speaking to her. She knows where she can get help. She continues to refuse to go. And then all of a sudden she decides, I need to go back to church. So every single church she goes into, she walks in smiling, then brings out her inspection. I'm going to inspect how they treated me when I walked in the door. I'm going to inspect everything about life. You can read this in this book. And you'll understand it comes from our thought. It comes from our life. It comes from things that we experience. And so as she goes to a church then, all of a sudden she's been going for a few, a couple Sundays to this church. She kind of likes this church, but there's still that reservation. And the pastor comes by and the pastor's wife comes by and they, they begin to talk to her about her church. And she begins to tell them about her experience and all the things that have happened in her life and how her things have just went wrong. And she is totally unhappy and she don't like church wow 
when she begins to talk to them, she got to the place where there's unwilling in her life to step into what God would have. You know why? Because her I will had become I want. I want this to happen. If this not happen, I'm not going to like it. I want this to happen. If that's not happening, then I'm not going to like it. I remember years ago. It's been years ago. It was on a Wednesday night. We were having missions on the second Wednesday night of every month. And I remember uh, coming in the parking lot and a, and a man who I love and had a heart for God and all those things. I, I said, I said, man, he said, we're not going in the sanctuary. I said, no. I said, we're having missions. He said, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going back home. I'm like, now hold on a minute. So we have a menu, multiple choice as a Christian. Oh, yeah, I don't like this part of my life, so... I'm not going to go to this, I'm not going to go to that, I'm going to go to this, I'm not going to go to that. We have a, like a multiple choice in serving the Lord. It happens. So when Heather goes to a church, she was ready when they came to her house and she pulled out nine things that, that, that happens in church. It's in, it's in right here. It happens in church that she, she said, you know something, these, these things are things that I, I, I pulled up from an article and I just wanna, I wanna give them to you. It's what she told them. She was encouraging them that she had been inspecting her life now, and, but mostly she had been inspecting their uh, church and she said, hey, here's, here's things that happen. She said, I want you to read these, these happen in every church I go to. She said, first of all, there's unfriendly church members. Did y'all know that happens? Even at Poovy's Chapel. Sometimes we are such in a zip to where we're going, we don't even think about somebody else being there. There's many stories about that we could be reminded of. There's, it's unsafe or unclean in the children's area. These were, these, were, these were the nine things. This, uh, no place to get information. There was a bad church website. She said there's bad, there's poor signage. I don't even know where I'm going. I just want to let you know something. If you come wandering around Poovy's Chapel, we do, we do have signs up here and there, but you might not even know what the signs mean. You might get lost for three or four days, amen? Inside our church language, there's... Boring or bad services? Sorry. I can't help that. <laughs> Members telling guests, here's, here's one that, that happens. Members telling guests, you're in my seat. <laughs> Whoo, that's fun right there. Hey, how many of you know we like to sit where we like to sit? Would you raise your hand? Praise the Lord. Amen. That's what I thought. Okay. Dirty facilities, just being dirty. She gave him all of these excuses. They were, they were very courteous and very kind to her. And they nodded their head and they said, yes, I know that all those can be a problem. They said, but here's your problem. You're wanting to be served rather than serve. We want everything comfortable. We want everything the way we want it. And if it's not the way we want it, then we're not going to do it. Amen. Amen. It happens in our life when we become unhappy. Unhappy in our life, unhappy in our relationships, unhappy with where we are. And so here, here's, some, here's some scripture that is given. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. So if I'm not walking in the way, then when somebody corrects me, then it's grievous to me. Then we hate. He said, he that hateth reproof shall die. You know what happens when we're not corrected and we don't take correction? Correction is not fun. Have you ever, y'all ever been going anywhere in your car? And as the wife, you had to tell the husband he was going the wrong way? You know what usually happens? No, I ain't. That's what that woman on the GPS just said, amen? <laughs> oh, you're going the wrong way. Y'all know, y'all do know something, don't you, ladies? We don't even know our right from left. We just driving, amen? That correction. The other one is the insider. We're going we're gonna to finish right here. I know we're not going to have time to go all the way down. But simply, 
when I talk about the insider and think about what is going on, it is simply no vision only focused on me. Now, I know we can be so others-focused that we never do what we're supposed to do, but that's not what God's talking about. Whenever he tells us in the Word how we should love him with all of our heart, and then we should follow him in so much that it seems like everything else means nothing in our life. But when we begin to follow Jesus, and we're loving Jesus, and we're walking with Jesus, and our heart is where it needs to be in the Word of God with Jesus, and we're letting Jesus be the Lord of our life, and we're saying, God, I just want to follow you then we understand, God, it really don't matter as much what I want as it does, God, I will. I think about Jonah. Jonah became an insider. He was a preacher. He was a prophet of God. Jonah took a whale of a ride. He's thrown overboard. A whale throws him up. He walks through Nineveh. He's unhappy, by the way. And he walks to Nineveh and said, I just want to let y'all know if y'all don't repent, God's going to kill every one of you. And he kept on walking. God sent revival in Nineveh. The whole city repented, including the children, all the way down to the beast of the field. You got to think about that. They all went on a three-day fast of repentance. Dogs, cats, Everything they had so that they could ha be where God would have them to be. But you know what Jonah could see? Mm, Lord, you didn't do what I wanted you to do. And it didn't turn out like I wanted you to do it. I wanted you to kill them all, Lord. <laughs> Jonah didn't want anybody from Nineveh living. Right. And God, it didn't turn out like I want. So I tell you what, Lord, since I'm here, why don't you just let this gourd grow up, be a shade of... Uh, I'm, just, just go ahead and take me out, Lord. I'm done. It's over. All I can see is me, and you didn't meet, meet what I wanted. So I'm ready to check on out, Lord. You know what? Boy, that's easy. It's easy to get that way. Amen? It's easy that I see me instead of I will. Well, we watch that insider in our life, and we understand we become inwardly focused. 90, about 90 to 92 percent of churches this morning in America are in inward focused mode. That means we are just making sure everybody's taken care of and as long as everybody's back has been padded and we just been made, made it through and oh yeah, we're all here. That is why today, as we are sitting in this, in this sanctuary this morning, there are 90% that are in decline. We become unhappy and we didn't fix unhappy. We become in that part of isolation. We become that part in our life of inspection. We become that part of, in our life of indignation of, of, of it's this not my way. And you ever watched a child that didn't get their way? They used to call them temper tantrums. Y'all remember them? I don't care who you read after, they ain't nobody knows how to control one of them things. They say let them do it in the floor. They say pick them up and wire their hind in out. There's all kind of stuff that can happen, amen? But I want to tell you, sometimes in our life we get that way. There's the insider. Lord, as long as I'm saved and my four saved and I'm, I'm good, we're going to heaven, praise the Lord. Woo, we're going to ride her out, change gears in the church pew and keep on rolling. Rather than God. You're saved me. You save me, and I will. Lord, what do you want me to do, God? When we say that, and you look at the Bible, and you see what is going on with people in the Bible, God didn't just, when somebody said, world. God left them most cases that you look at in the Bible. When we say, I will, we're going to follow Jesus right where we are, but we become a shining light. It is dusting off our globe and saying, God, I want to shine bright for you. I want to give you this scripture as an invitation this morning. And we're, we're, we're in closing, unlocking the door. If I'm unhappy, how am I going to unlock the door? Jesus said it real plain. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Simply this in our life. 
How long has it been since we just fell in love with Jesus? So much that it made us fall in love with his church. There's many things I could go on and say, but we're, we're, we're stopping right here. I want us to stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed for just a minute. If you're physically able, listen, if you've got a baby in your arms and they're they asleep, keep rocking the baby. Praise the Lord. But as we stand together this morning, I want to ask you something personally in your life. How long has it been, how long has it been in your life as a Christian, as a believer, how long has it been since you've just been thriving as a Christian? I'm talking about, I'm not just talking about doing stuff. Sometimes as Christians we think, oh yeah, I'm doing this, this, this. No, I'm not, that don't even have anything to do with it. We can do stuff without having the heart to do stuff. How long has it been since your heart and my heart has just been happy with Jesus? <laughs> not having to add anything to, not trying to make this work or that work, but my heart. Jesus said like this, I'm standing at your door. I'm knocking on your door. And I'm just saying, if you'll just come to me, listen, let's, let's, let's fix our relationship. Let's just let Jesus be Lord. You say this morning, Pastor, as a Christian, I just need to come this morning. I just want God to help me. Listen, I want God to, God to use me. I want to I wanna be in that I will. I want to be in that place of yielding my heart. Listen, would you just be honest with God? Would you come? Listen, maybe this morning you need to come pray for your Sunday school class. And maybe, maybe you need to come pray for your small group. It might be this morning you need to come pray for your church. God, I, I just want to love you. I want to see you do a work in my life, in my church, in my, in my heart. God, I want, I want you to put that fire in my life again. Listen, while these are coming, while God is speaking, listen, how, how long has it been since you just said, just said, I will pray for myself. I will pray for my church. I will pray for my choir. Listen, how long has it been since, since your heart was just thriving and beating and in, in rhythm with God for what God wants to do in your life? Listen, while these are coming, and God is just speaking to us today. Listen, what about in our life? God says, I want you to come to me. I want to follow you. How long has it been since we just said, Lord, I will. God, I want to follow you. I want you to be lifted up in my life, Lord. I want you to be seen in my life, God. I want, I want God who is able to work in me. I want them to see you in me, Lord, above everything else. Maybe today you need to confess, God, I'm just so unhappy. In my life. Can I just tell you something today? Listen, it may be because that you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Here's what the Bible says. Is joy. That is an automatic thing that happens in the life of a believer. Is joy because when we trust in Jesus, He gives us joy. How long has it been since my joy has been full? Or maybe today I've never trusted Jesus. You say this morning, Pastor, I'm really not sure I'm a Christian. Pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved this morning, but pray for me. I want to I wanna know the Lord. I want to know that I know the Lord. Pray for me. Pray for me. You say this morning, Pastor, as a, as a Christian, listen, I know there's things in my life today that God is speaking to me about or God has spoken to me about this morning that are in my life, and God is just dealing with me about those things. Pray for you. Did you just slip your hand up this morning? God bless your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being honest with God. Thank you. Oh, listen, it's so easy sometimes to allow things to get us from where we need to be of God. You say this morning, Pastor, it's my desire today. To see God do something in me personally. I need God to help me personally. Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to be his. I want God to do something in my life personally. Hallelujah. God bless your hearts. Oh, I'm glad we can hear him this morning. Father, we love you. God, we praise you, Lord. God, for every need around this altar, Lord, we want to give you thanksgiving God, that you are the God, and we want to agree together right now. God, you would help us to hear you. Help us, God, to follow you. Help us to walk with you. God, I pray for every person in this building today, God, Lord, that does not know you as Savior and Lord. God, that even right now, right where they are, God, they will trust in you, Lord. God, realize, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I've never trusted you, Jesus, and if I die today, I'll be in hell and Jesus right now confess I am a sinner Lord Jesus I believe you died on the cross for me you were buried and you rose again and Jesus right now I trust you I ask you Lord Jesus to speak life into me and save me forgive me of my sins Lord I, I commit to walk and follow you in your word and in your witness and following you in the house of the Lord God I just want to give my life today to follow you 
Lord, I praise you for what you're going to do, God. I pray, Lord, all of us this morning, God, in that place that you've spoken in our hearts, God, about things in our life that we need to, that God, that we need to confess before you, repent of, and allow you to work in us, oh God, to restore our joy, God, to restore our heart, God, to restore my our will before you, God. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Father, God, to realize, Jesus, you said in your word that you had to pray through going to the cross. You despised the cross, but you saw the joy that was going to come from the cross. Lord, I want to praise you for walking obediently and saying, I will. Help us to say, I will, God. Lord, all of us have in our heart, we should have that thrive in our heart, that burning in our heart, that love in our life for you, for others, Lord, for ourselves, to walk with you, God, and to walk where you would have us to walk, to glorify your name. God, help us, Lord, to realize when we have been like Heather was in this book. God, and we realize that is a real life story. That in that place in her life, she became so unhappy and unsettled. God, thank you for returning that joy to her when she returned to you. God, help us to return to you and follow you. Thank you for what you're going to do. We give you praise. We give you glory. God, we give you honor in the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad today God is in control? Amen.